thank you. An invitation to my board members to come on their screens so that uh, everybody can see you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Max Disposti. I am pronounced AMS. I'm the board president, and I would like to welcome you to the Board of Behavioral Sciences board meeting. Today is March 4th, 2021, and the time is 8.34 on my clock. This meeting is occurring at various locations pursuant to Executive Order N-25-20. It is dated March 12th, 2020. Um, this public meeting will be held via WebEx platform. And good morning to you, moderator. Could you please explain how we will conduct in the comments portion of this meeting? Thank you. Good morning. For the public comment portion of this meeting, we will be utilizing the WebEx question and answer feature. At the point in time when the chair requests for public comment, we will open what we call a Q&A panel. And you will find this panel by clicking on the Q&A icon on your screen, which looks like a question mark inside of Square. That will pop open a window that will give you a text field where you will type, I would like to make a comment and submit that to all panelists. We will be taking comments in the order that they are received. And if that, I'll turn that back over. Oh, and a reminder, you will have two minutes to make your comment. With that, I'll turn it back over to the board chair. Thank you so much, moderator. And uh, Christina Kitamura, could you please establish a quorum for us? Thank you. Good morning. Max Disposti? Here. Christina Wong? Here. Crystal Anthony? Here. Deborah Brown? Is Deborah here today? I believe not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yvette Casares Willis? Here. Ross Ehrlich? I'm here. Uh, just, I. Still having issues getting my video started, so I don't know if that's okay. I have your verbal attendance. Thank you, Susan Freeman. Here, Diana Herwick. Here, Christopher Jones. Here, Kelly Ronasindi. Here, Wendy Strack. Here. And we have Jonathan Maddox, John Sobek, Deborah Brown are absent. If I haven't missed anybody, we have a quorum. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, and uh, I will now open for public comments for items that are not on the agenda. Um, as a reminder, the board might not discuss or take any actions on any matters raised during the public comment section except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. So please remember to use the raise hands function if you like to make a comment and each commenter will be allowed two minutes as our moderator has already anticipated. Um, so I, moderator, I don't know if there are any comments in the, in the queue. Not as of yet. As a reminder, if you'd like to make a comment, please click on the Q&A icon on your screen. Type, I would like to make a comment into the text field and submit that to all panelists. Perfect. I'll wait another 30 seconds in case people have any technical difficulties to place a question, so make a comment. Um, if not. Not seeing any comments at this time. Okay, then I will now open for suggestions for future agenda items. Um, again, please remember to raise the hand function if you would like to make a comment. Each commenter will be allowed two minutes. <clears throat> okay. Moderator, looks like we don't have any comments on this agenda item as well. Am I correct? Not yet at this moment. As a reminder, our Q&A panel is open. If you'd like to make a comment regarding future agenda items, please click on your Q&A icon on the screen. Type, I would like to make a comment into the text field and submit that to all panelists. Okay. I'm not seeing anything. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for your help on this. Um, 
So before I turn over to our administrative law judge, which I haven't seen on, on the screen, so I don't know um, their name yet. Um, uh, Ross, just a quick yeah. suggestion. Sure. If you would like to log out and try to come back in to see if your video can be activated that way, so that once, once you go to this portion of the proceeding hearings, we want to make sure that board members are obviously recorded participate I'll, I'll, I'll try that right now i'll try that right thank now. you so much thank you so much um so moderator yes and max uh the uh, the administrative law judge is uh here timothy aspenwall um but we are still looks like waiting for the court reporter so we might want to take a, a little bit of a break until the court okay. reporter shows up if that's okay um i'm okay with that perhaps what we can do just take a five minutes break right now mm -hmm. and it's 8 40 coming back at 8 45 and hopefully we have the recorder and i will move this portion of the meeting under the um, administration of the law judge and hopefully we're ready to go then thank you steve thank you so at 8 45 we are resuming this public portion of the meeting thank you so much Welcome back, everyone. Um, welcome back to the Board of Behavioral Sciences. My name is Max Disposti. I'm the chair of this board, and the time is 8.58. Uh, we will now move on the uh, public hearing portion of this meeting. So I will move uh, under Judge King, the responsibility to introduce our first petitioner. Hello, Judge King. Good morning. How are you, sir? Very good. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you. And do we have the court reporter on the line? I, I'm sorry, I missed that part earlier. I believe so, yes. Okay. Yes, we All do. Right. It's Megan first, Mendoza. Okay, thank you. Um, the first case that we're calling is Timothy Willison. Mr. Willison, are you present? I am. Okay. Uh, Ms. Mendoza, if we could please go on the record. Okay, good morning, everyone. We are on the record and we are before the Board of Behavioral Sciences to review the petition for early termination of probation by Timothy D. Willison. This is OAH case number 2021-020326. The board's case number is 2002-016-01520. My name is Tiffany King. I am an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I've been assigned to preside over this matter. Um, if we could please have the board members, I, I please identify themselves for the record so we can establish a quorum. Christina, would you mind to call the quorum, please? Thank you. Absolutely. Max Disposti? Here. Christina Wong? Here. Crystal Anthony? Here. Yvette Casares Willis. Here. Ross Ehrlich. Here. Susan Friedman. Susan Friedman. Here. Diana Herwick. Here. Christopher Jones. Here. Kelly Ranasinghe. Here. Wendy Strack. Here. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Steinheimer, can you please state your appearance for the record? Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, Your Honor and board members. My name is Andrew Steinheimer, uh, Deputy Attorney General. I'm appearing on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people uh, of the state of California. Thank you. And Mr. Willison, I will note for the record that you are present and representing yourself today. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And sir, were you aware that you could have retained an attorney to represent you? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so I wanted to go over, I don't know what all Judge Aspinwall went over um, prior to going on the record, but a little bit of a roadmap for how we'll proceed this morning. And when we begin, Mr. Steinheimer will the petition and provide an orientation to the board in this matter. Um, after that, you will be able to make your presentation under oath as to why you think that your probation should be terminated early. 
You have the right to call witnesses on your behalf, subject to cross-examination by Mr. Steinheimer. Uh, we already have your petition and your documents. Um, after any questions by Mr. Steinheimer, I will pull the board and see if they have any questions, uh, any questions from you. I do want to remind you that the board is particularly concerned with the rehabilitation you've achieved uh, since being put on probation. We're not here to relitigate the underlying action as that matter has already been uh, decided. I also remind you that the board members have received and read your petition package already. So you can certainly refer to things in your petition packet, but we don't need you to go over it in, in huge uh, detail. They already have that information. Great. After today's hearings, the board will go into closed session to deliberate. You will not receive a decision today, but you will receive it in the mail sometime in the future. Do you have any questions at this point? I don't. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Steinheimer, do you have any preliminary matters before we begin with your presentation? Uh, no, Your Honor. Okay, then I'll turn the floor over to you, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to mark for identification and offer into evidence uh, what I'll call Exhibit 1, which will be the uh, petition packet and all the accompanying documents. Uh, the board members and petitioner have been uh, provided with a copy of these uh, documents. And Exhibit 1 generally consists of uh, a brief memo outlining Mr. Willison's case. Uh, his petition for reinstatement, which is dated June 27th, 2020. Uh, petitioner's supporting documentation, which generally consists of a personal statement from the petitioner, as well as approximately six letters of support. It also consists of the decision and order in BBS case number 2002-016001548. Which was effective July 7th, 2017. It includes a notice to appear at the petition hearing and then a certification of licensure history related to the petitioner. And so I'd ask that this be admitted into evidence at this time, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Willison, do you have any objection to Exhibit 1 uh, being admitted at this time? No, Your Honor. Okay. Exhibit 1 is admitted. Uh, thank you. Now I'd like to provide just a brief history of uh, petitioner's license uh, history. Uh, petitioner was first licensed as a marriage and family therapist on or about July 14th, 1998. Uh, his license number is LMFT34937. On December 6, 2016, the board filed an accusation against petitioner the accusation alleged that the petitioner was subject to discipline based on his inappropriate sexual conduct toward a patient. The petitioner and the board agreed to a stipulated settlement, which was effective July 7th, um, 2017. And pursuant to the stipulated settlement, petitioner's license was revoked, but the revo revocation was stayed and petitioner was placed on probation for a period of seven years. Uh, including various terms and conditions. Uh, petitioner has complied with the terms of his probation to this point, and petitioner's probation is currently scheduled to end in July of 2024. Petitioner is now before the board requesting that the board grant the early termination of his probation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Willison, now is the time for you to present uh, your case, and if you would please raise your right hand so I can swear you in. Do you solemnly state under penalty of perjury that the evidence you will give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, just a, a few uh, housekeeping items. Um, I want you to go ahead and tell your story in, in a narrative format. I will advise you that Mr. Steinheimer might have an objection to portions of your testimony. If you hear him state the word objection, please pause and allow me to rule on that objection before you continue. If you are going to refer to anything in your petition packet, if you could please let myself and the board know what page you're looking at so they can follow along, that would be very helpful. When you're done with your direct statement, just let me know and then I can turn questioning over to Mr. Steinheimer followed by the board members. Any questions at this point? No, Your Honor. Okay, sir, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um... Well, first, I, um, I appreciate the opportunity to present my case and come before uh, this group or this board and, and, um, 
and offer my story or tell you why I think uh, early termination is appropriate. Um, I am uh, a little nervous, so I'm, I may misspeak or forget things and I, I think I'll come around. I have some notes I'll be working out though because I didn't really trust myself to, um, to do this just uh, through recall. Um, and I, I do have uh, a narrative. Um, I won't, I don't necessarily, I don't have the case in front of me, so I won't be referencing specific places. Um, let me just start. Um, um, you know, at the beginning of this process and, um, Come July, it'll be four years now on probation. Um, I felt um, upset by the process. I felt badly treated. You know, I it was clear that I had made mistakes. Um, but uh, I, I felt at the time in the beginning that um, the consequences were overly broad or heavy. You know, I felt mistreated. Um, and that, um, my point of view has shifted considerably over time, you know, um, as a result of a lot of work, as a result of a lot of denial falling away. Um, and it is probably fair to say as a result of the process working the way it's supposed to work, you know, um, um, you know, because my discipline involved physical contact with the client and because it was very public, um, there has been a lot of guilt and shame and remorse to walk through. Um, you know, the, um, and I'll, I'll outline some of the things that I've done in, in a second in order to try and work with the issues that resulted in the discipline. Um, but as a result of this work over time, I came to see my behavior with this client, um, frankly, as not as a non-clinical word, but um, creepy, you know, and I don't think anyone likes to see themselves as a um, creep. Um, but that, that work or that realization also, um, it, uh, it helped me make room for, um, all the colleagues that, um, no longer want to associate with me. Because it made me realize if I were reading what I had done and it hadn't been me, then my perspective might be much like theirs, you know. Um, so, um, what became very clear and what's in the paperwork uh, that I submitted was that it became very clear over time that my errors in judgment, you know, were pretty directly related to early experience for me. I, I, out of a, a lot of early trauma with a mother who struggled. Um, um, with a lot of depression and suicidality and a lot of alcohol. And I, um, and this part is challenging to say in a public forum, but um, it's also outlined in what I wrote that the truth is that in what became clear over time was that as a result of early experiences, a way that deep grief or sadness um, became eroticized for me. Um, it's probably easier actually to be saying this to you through a computer in my office than it would be to be sitting in a room with you, you know. Um, I, I also just need to um, <laughs> I need to say, because I mean, having done a lot of work around mother stuff, I mean, therapists always do. I also, by way of 
offering a clear picture, not that you'll ever know her or need to know, but that she was a very devoted woman in many, many ways to me. And so I don't in any way want to come off as trying to malign her, but I do want to try and source the, um, the roots of my conduct, you know. Um, and so I have really gotten to work in the last several years. I, um, I did a, a course of therapy with a, um, a woman who works with deep grief, kind of a life coach. Um, I was involved for a number of months in somatic experiencing, which is a, a technique for working with trauma. I've also done some brain spotting, which is another way of working with trauma. Um, also worked with a, uh, a somatic practitioner around issues of sexuality, you know, to try and get some clarity about what I would characterize as my leakage, you know. Um, and um, I really have done everything and continue to do everything I can think of to do um, to better see my mistakes and to and to heal and, and, you know, to be safer. You know, I, I think I said, am I right? I mean, nobody goes in this profession wanting to do damage. And I did. Um, so, um, a, a couple more things. I, um, just to say over the course of four years or close to four years, I've had three supervisors. I had a difficult relationship with my first supervisor um, that I could go into later in questions if you want to hear more about that. But um, our relationship consisted mostly of case management. And after a year, I found a different supervisor um, at her request and at my desire. And, um, and the second, um, Bill, who has moved out of state since I feel really, really grateful for. We did a whole lot of, um, there was some case management, but there was a lot of what you could call therapy or a lot of boundary related work, you know, that um, working with how I negotiate, don't negotiate intimacy. And, um, and I really felt um, both seen by him and I felt like I had an opportunity to start to um, both see new things and build um, build new things you know um so bill blazik uh moved out of state uh, a few months ago and i um i got a recently got a third supervisor a man named rob getty who um, who also I we've done it he actually is has a trauma specialty and we have done some brain spotting in addition to to case management too and that has been remarkably um, impactful for me. I'm not really a technique oriented therapist and I have to acknowledge the power of these things that I've done. Um, um, so, you know, being almost four years in, uh, there, there are three primary differences I see in myself. Um, now as opposed to um, then, now as opposed to um, at the time of my mistakes and the time of my discipline. Uh, and the first is I just feel a much uh, deeper and more developed awareness of myself, uh, my needs and, and the um, identification, acknowledgement and the acting on. That is all there's a lot more clarity in me about that than there used to be. And um, as a result of this work and, and a lot of things, I think, you know, um, you know, second thing is that in both my personal and professional life, I do feel um, a, a kind of extraordinary difference in the, um, in my ability to recognize the need for a work within and establish boundaries. Um, you know, I, 
I have characterized myself sometimes to friends as I feel like a, you know, uh, in my 60s, I feel like a teenager in terms of some of this work, you know, and, um, but it, it's been um, helpful and transformative for me, um, both inside and outside the office. You know, I do, I see a lot of changes that are more than you need or want to hear here that are, are resulting from this, you know. Um, there's an expression by Joseph Campbell. Um, he says that where you stumble, there your treasure lies. I have stumbled here and the last four years have been about trying to find the treasure in the place that I stumbled. Um, you know, the third major difference that I see is that I, um, it's just a real, and I guess I referenced this a little bit in this before, but my, my relationships, and I mean this more outside of the business, outside of the therapy office, you know, I think part of the, what led to my problem, part of what led to my mistakes was, uh, was an absence of the kind of real genuine intimacy that we all need. And I, I feel like that, my capacity around that has really flourished in the last four years um, as a result of the work that I've done, um, which makes me happier, um, more satisfied. And also I think it makes me safer um, because I think Again, like, like there's a little leakage, um, and I think that's part of what was going on when I made the mistakes that I made. Um, um, so just kind of in closing, um, you know, 35 or so years ago, um, I was drug addicted, uh, depressed, incarcerated, uh, suicidal, and lost. And as a result of a lot of grace and a lot of good fortune, I found my way into treatment and I found my way in this profession. And I, and I found a way of taking a lot of ugliness and a lot of error and turning into something valuable. You know, and, and in those 35 years, I've been able to talk to people who have walked through what I've walked through and been able to give them something that's made a difference for them. So my hope is with these recent challenges and recent mistakes is to do something similar to, to try and find the gold in it, you know, to be working maybe in a workshop way or I'm not sure, but with ethics and with um, you know, with growth and and with the the things that as therapists we need to be able to see in in order to be able to avoid inflicting ourselves on our clients um, in the way that I did. Um, that's my hope. And this is in my letter, but just on a, you know, in a practical nature, the part of the reason that I'm asking for early releases are, it's twofold really. One is that I do feel like I've benefited tremendously from this process and I regret deeply that it, that it comes at the expense of someone. But I feel as though in that way, the system has worked in a way that it's supposed to. Uh, something was identified. I was identified. I was called to task. I was compelled to look at the things that I needed to look at. And I feel like I really in a wholehearted way have done that. And I feel changed through the process. Um, the other thing is that um, it has been devastating financially. You know, I, I've lost uh, a contract with the state. Um, I no longer receive referrals from UC Davis, which is where I live. And I'm no longer allowed to advertise in a lot of places because I'm on probation. Um, so um, 
I'm not sure exactly how many years left I'll work, but I'd like to be able to um, to rebuild my practice some before it becomes time to retire. So, um, um, so again, I appreciate the time and the chance to offer this and and um, and to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Willison. Mr. Steinheimer, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just have a few brief questions for you, Mr. Willison. Uh, first, you've described in your statement and then here this morning, uh, some of the, the treatment or therapy that you've gone through, the work that you've done. Um, but I'd like to, uh, I'd like to know, are you still um, in some type of therapy or treatment? And what is your plan going forward with, with respect to that? Yeah, well, I, I am, I mean, presently in supervision with Rob Getty. And I would continue to see him whether or not I was uh, compelled to. Um, in large part, because the brain spotting has been uh, surprisingly um, effective to me. So that's one thing I would do. Um, I also am working, continue to work here locally in Davis with um, a woman who does somatic experiencing. Um, so, you know, both these things geared towards continuing to work with, um, um, with trauma, you know. Uh, I am also, uh, I continue to be involved uh, with Narcotics Anonymous um, which is not a, you know, not professional, but in terms of support and supporting others, that's another ongoing means of support that I have. Okay, thank you. Um, with respect to that, um, what, what is your sobriety date in, in NA? In November 7th, 1985. Okay. And uh, you say you continue to uh, work in or with uh, NA, do you currently have a sponsor or is it just a little less formal than that? I do, but it's, it's, um, it's a long distance. It's somebody I, I, I got clean and sober and worked in treatment in Los Angeles for a number of years before moving north. And so, um, it's, um, it, at this point in time, given the amount of time, but it's, it's a, it's a friendship slash sponsor relationship, someone that I'm in touch with, but not in the same way that not in the same sort of rigorous way that someone in early recovery usually is. Um, and then you mentioned that you, you think you would continue to work um, in the future with your new super, your current supervisor, even if it's no longer required. Uh, can you explain a little bit about, um, I guess, how that supervision is, is helping you or what you're, what you're gaining from that? Um, you mean in terms of the, the brain spotting I mentioned, or more broadly? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not really sure what brain spotting is, but um, I'm assuming the board members have a better understanding, but so so broadly and, and maybe specifically as well. Sure. Well, just it, um, frankly, both with Bill who moved and also with Rob, um, I really appreciated um, having a strong, supportive, older male presence, you know, so that's part of it for me. Um, and, you know, I do do consultation locally um, with a clinician um, here, but I, it really helps to have more than one voice, I think, when it comes to both working with people and also what comes up for me when I'm working with people. So I appreciated Rob's voice around that. Um, the, the brain spotting is just in a way that seems almost um, magical kind of. It's, it's working with your visual field as sort of a representation of your, your, your limbic system. And by identifying particular spots that you have a visceral response to, it's a way of working with early trauma, almost absent story. There's not a whole lot of story necessary involved in it. And I was, frankly skeptical moving into it and very, very surprised to find myself deeply affected by the work. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Willison. I will um, now turn it over to the judge to ask that the board members have questions. Thank you, Mr. Steinheimer. Okay, we're just pull the board in the order we identified themselves this morning. Mr. Disposti, do you have any questions? 
Yes, I do. I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Willison, can you hear me? I can. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. I, I can see, um, like uh, our uh, judge said, that we're not here to rehash. You know, the, the 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 what brought you here. But I, I'm a little bit curious about. Um, it seems to me really that this was an opportunity for you to really look into the dynamics, right, of what happened. And so I'm wondering if probation was so helpful. One thing I'm missing in your feedback, it's just not clear. We understand probation is also, you know, it's not something fun to go through. It creates limitations. It creates a lot of disclosures that people might not feel comfortable with in, in regards to your profession. But it also brought you here in, in, in your elaboration, right, of what has happened. So why why now? Why? Um, obviously, there was an intent from the board. You know, the seven years might seem a long time, but also it was an opportunity to grow through this process. So why now? And if you can speak more to what the probation has done to you, good and bad, um, in terms of like what, how is limiting you, and why the termination of the probation now when there is Till some time to go. I apologize. I was trying to look for the dates. I couldn't find it, but I know we are not almost there, right? Um, so can you tell us more about that? Because I was missing in your narrative, I was missing that portion of that. Sure. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Well, it, I mean, in terms of benefits, the, the good and the bad, um, in the way that I was talking about, I it had it's it's definitely been cold water in my face, you know, because of the discipline, because of the consequences. I, you know, I've had to look in places that, um, and, and again, I, it reminds me a little bit about the, you know, drug addict and denial, and it's usually consequences that compel them to deal with the things they have to deal with. You know, I, I got into treatment 35 years ago because I had charges pending in three different courts. I had to, right? And in the same kind of way here, I have is I had issues and have issues that I'm working with that I dealt with because I was compelled to by this process, right? And so I, and in that way, I feel really served by it. You know, I do. Um, I'm a better person for it. Um, there's more um, more open to challenge, and I'm more um, I'm less defended now. You know. Um, in terms of now, part of it is that, um, you know, um, you mentioned, yeah, seven years does feel like a long time, but coming up on four now. Um, and a, a large part of uh, the motivation is, um, is financial concern. You know, my, my practice is about half of what it was. I just turned 65, I think actually tomorrow. And I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to work, you know, if, if if it were to go to full term on probation, I would be 68. And I, I'm hoping to work in, in a more full practice for a while before I, before I finish. So, um, so fiscal realities are part of why, a big part of why. Um, and, and maybe the biggest, I mean, it would be, I'd, I'd rather, there's expense involved with this, but I, but I do, I will see Rob, at least for a time, even if you guys decide to grant my petition, so there'd be maybe less expense. I might see him every other week rather than every week, something like that. Um, but I guess that's the biggest part of my answer is, answer is I'm, I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling my age and I'm feeling um, financial stress. Okay, I, I appreciate you answering that. So, in lieu of that, I would like to follow back, uh, follow up with something. So, because obviously the provision is in place to guarantee public safety, right? That's our role. And how, um, so what are your, the mechanism you put in place to check in, check balances in regards to, you know, how can you guarantee this is never going to happen again to the public? Um, and then also, what, what is your support system that actually is there for you when you need it in relation specifically to the reason why you're in probation? So um, who's there to check for you, pretty much? That's where I'm going with this. Absolutely. Part of, 
in retrospect, part of what my, you know, when at the time of the, um, uh, the therapy that resulted in the complaint, I had just come back from a period of travel. Um, I wasn't in, I was just getting divorced and I, excuse me, and I wasn't in consultation. I'm generally in a consultation group, you know, which is helpful. So um, in, in a sense, I was more vulnerable then than usual, you know. Um, and what's true now is that um, um, I am in regular consultation with a woman that I've been working with here for a, a long time in Davis. What's also true is that there's a, I have a group of um, mostly clinician friends who I have had to lean on in part as a result of this process and talk to about, um, I mean, there's been a lot of hashing through. Um, and so I really feel their support around me in a much more substantive way than I did before. Um, I also, um, my 12 step involvement, I've drifted from 12 step for a long time, you know, after early attendance and in part because of all that's been going on, I found my way back into meetings and found my way back into that support network. Um, there's another one that I wanted to add to that. Um, Well, I have another answer to your question. It, it escapes my head right now, but um, if it comes back, I'll throw it in. But, okay. Sure. No, no, you did answer. So I, I appreciate Mr. it. Mr. Just can I remind everyone to slow down just a little bit, please? Yes, thank you. No problem, Ms. Mendoza. Thank you. Um, I was just following up to the question saying that I'm, I'm, the answer, the question was answered. So I'm, 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 I'm done with questions. So thank you, Your Honor. Th thank you. Uh, thank, you, Ms. Wong. thank you. Ms. Wong, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so good morning, um, um, Mr. Willison. Actually, Dr. Willison. <laughs> so, um, so I want to thank you for coming up. And I also want to acknowledge, you know, the struggle that financially it is really hard, you know, on the probationer. And so, you know, it's very understandable that, you know, you want to get off uh, probation, you know, as soon as you can. And so, and, um, but I do have, um, you know, some question for you. The first one is about, you know, in your testimony, you know, you, you had that quote about, you know, stumble, you know, when you stumble and where there's the treasure. And so I, I want to just follow up and, and, you know, and just kind of like check in with your um, understanding. Do you identify, you know, your act? It's like, it's a stumble. Or how would you actually, you know, categorize or characterize, you know, your action? Under um, that context. Ab absolutely, I would characterize it as a stumble and and in a way, one of the worst kind in that, I mean, when I was a drunk and I crashed a car, um, the consequences were all mine other than legal ones. So it's a different, there's a different weight that goes with stumbling in a way that harms someone else, right? You know, so it's absolutely that. Um, but there's, you know, but, and it has led though to um, a, a difficult acknowledgement about sort of my relationship to, um, to desire or, you know, I, again, I referenced before this, I, you know, the, what became clear to me when it, it is still kind of hard to say publicly, this fact that sadness for me in a sense was eroticized and so what I was characterizing or trying to characterize in my mind as support wasn't clean, you know, it was quote unquote creepy, right? You know, and so, um, but you know, I, it, I should, you know, my, my PhD when I did my dissertation way back when was on desire, right? You know, so I came out of, as an addict trying to figure out, you know, as an addict in the early in the beginning you're told you know don't don't pay attention to your head your head got you here listen to others right because you need the support of other people and for me trying to figure out 
when I could start to trust my own intuitions and when I can move ahead. And so, and this is, um, this is an elaboration of that or further answers around that, around where I was, I was deluding myself in a way that was not, um, that I was not being clean about or letting myself see. So, so I do feel like, um, you know, along with that quote, there's another quote like, you know, any kind of journey of transformation is a passing through your own wounds. And this so clearly feels like that to me. You know, this the, call it a mother wound or early whatever. This is, you know, this is, uh, and it's ugly and it's difficult and it's not much fun, but, but there is, um, there's growth and there's payoff that comes from it. Okay. So, you know, so sounds like, you know, you do recognize that, you know, your, you know, your healing, you know, is still pretty, you know, on the early stage, you know, because of, you know, just still how painful it is, you know, to acknowledge and to, you know, sometimes, I mean, this is a public forum, which I totally can understand how hard it is, <laughs> you know, at the same time, you know, no, it's understandable. At the same time, you know, I, you know, I, I still feel that, you know, that, um, you know, that it is, it is still pr pretty painful. And so, you know, so maybe on that sense, then I would actually follow up with the, the question is like, what, you know, how do you describe your healing? Because, you know, you're really talking about some very, very deep wound here. And so do, would you characterize it, characterize, characterize it as early stage, whatever? It feels like a good question. You know, um, one thing I... So there, there is a, a rawness, you know, um, but, but I would care. So that's actually been a part of the process that I appreciate is not just, so it isn't so much that, um, that there's a rawness that I'm looking to heal from and get over. It's more like in my experience has been one that I, as a result of this, I mean, other things too, that I am just more, emotionally present in my life now than I have been before. And that, so that, and I, I think that looks like Ron is sometimes, you know, so, um, but I don't really feel as though, but I, what am I trying to say? That's something I'm glad about, right? Is like that there's a way that, I, cause I do feel, you know, if you look at in terms of a, a presence kind of way that I'm more here than I used to be. And that does, um, so in a, in a way that in my mind is representative of healing and not representative of a need for healing, but a representative of healing that's happened, you know? Right. So it's still in the er very early stage in that sense, because it happens, you know, that still needs to, you know, let that presence, you know, that your feeling of presence, you know, really be able to sustain and really be able to, the most important thing is really about when you're in the clinical setting, you know, with the clients, then how are you able to, you know, to transform, you know, that that healing and, you know, making sure that, you know, that you are able to, like you say, your intuition, you're not second guessing your intuition, you're able to, you know, to, to relate with the clients, you know, in a way that you're not um, having the tra counter transference with them. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So, well, thank you very much. I think I will leave the rest of the question for my other fellow board member. Thank you so much, Dr. Willison. Sure, thank you. I have no more questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Wong. Uh, Ms. Anthony, do you have any questions? Yes, um, I, mine's really simple. Um, what are your day-to-day -day, um, like coping skills, like activities that you do for yourself? Um, like what are, the things that help keep you grounded, the self-care tools that you use on a daily basis? It's, it's um, that, those kind of things have become, especially through this period, extraordinarily important, you know? I mean, so I, um, it, part of it is, a, um, you know, sort of a, a spiritual pursuit um, that doesn't have, a clear name. It's more I like, you know, 12 step programs often characterize themselves as spiritual rather than religious. And for me, uh, the third step and 12 step program has been a real opening onto that to having a sense of feeling held, 
you know, by the universe. So, so some of it is that, and I sit every morning and part of my um, intent in sitting is connecting with that deeper sense, you know, I, in a way of, um, you call a collective, Carl Jung, the collective unconscious, when you sink deeply enough down, you connect not just with the individual, but with, uh, you want to call it the numinous or the, or the collective, you know, so I, um, that's part of my self-care is to, and that again, goes way, way back to doing a third step on the patio of this treatment center in Pasadena's. It's feeling my sense of connectedness with something larger than me. Um, in addition to that, uh, yoga has been a lifesaver. Regular exercise is a lifesaver. And I also, in a way that um, more than I ever have in my life, actually, I have this network of people that, um, th that I talk to on a daily basis. I'm talking to at least one or a couple people and not just about how the weather is, but about, you know, it's more like a soul weather report. It's about where I might be torn up that day or what happens to be going on. So I feel well held by a support network and more than I have in my life, actually, you know. And so the friendships and connections, sitting on a regular basis, writing often, and, um, and I need exercise of some sort every day to kind of remind myself to have a body. Those are the main things I think of. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Willis, do you have any questions? Um, thank you. No questions for me at this time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ehrlich? Hi, yes, I do have uh, one question. Thank you, first of all, for being here today um, and talking about um, talking about this. <laughs> Uh, my question is, what what sort of concrete safeguards can you tell us that you have in place to ensure that, you know, an incident like this doesn't happen again? Well, a few things. I, I appreciate it. That's actually the part I wanted to add to a previous question that, that I've forgotten about. So thank you for your question. You know, one is just that um, I simply don't ever have physical contact with a client, ever, right? That's just not appropriate for me. Um, and I also am in regular consultation um, with a clinician who's uh, aware of my discipline, aware of the reasons around it. And so, especially if I'm working with a, a client of the opposite sex, um, we're, we collaborate pretty closely on what's going on, what's appropriate, what's not. Um, also, I mean, this is more about COVID and the precautions that I have done, but the, you know, of course the vast bulk of my work right now is online rather than in person, you know, that that's an externally um, instituted um, safeguard, I guess you could say, of course, COVID will go away, you know, but, um, and, and this is not as concrete, but I'm just always looking in a way that I wasn't before. You know, I, um, there was a certain, I would say, naivete, you know, or um, about how I approached the work before that is no longer there. And so I, again, this is less concrete, but I hold myself more accountable than I used to. Okay. Thank you for that. Sure. Any other questions, Mr. Ehrlich? Sorry, no, no further questions, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Friedman. Can you hear me? I have I have one question. Okay. Um, Dr. Wilson, thank you very, very much for being here. Uh, you, you mentioned your age, and first of all, I am curious whether you've been vaccinated. Uh, yeah. I got my second one a couple of weeks ago, fortunately. Great. Yeah. And, and my question is, um, you mentioned, of course, the way we're, you're practicing right now. Do you feel comfortable without that um, presence of another person in the room? Do you feel comfortable working this way, which 
may be the way you'll be working who knows the rest of your life possibly we don't know but working remote like this uh, and knowing that there are so many people out there who as a result of this pandemic are going to be requiring some kind of help yeah may require you to continue working like this yeah i i think um i think my answer is yes and no you know i think that um um there's a huge need right now i mean i clients are, are so many people um kind of falling over the edge you know everything whatever the pathology is it seems amplified by the pandemic right you know and so i i recognize the necessity and i also in a way that i wouldn't have expected prior to this am sometimes surprised by the efficacy of work online it can be really powerful people can be really held and get better and but the no part is that um sometimes something as simple as you know to be talking with somebody online and the connection is funny and you don't notice for a while that there are tears running down their cheeks right whereas if you were in person that would be in your immediate frame of reference right so um so i'm i guess i'm adjusting right you know to necessary circumstances and um and and I, and I am increasingly finding myself surprised by what's possible online, you know, that, that and so I, and also the, I mean, there's realistically, there's a certain amount of freedom that goes with that then, because you can, if you're practicing online, you can go places and do it there. And I, I, um, I like the idea of that, you know, that, that potential freedom and being able to practice and being able to move around. So. I mean, do you find that helpful in your practice? Do I find it helpful working with them online as opposed to in person, you mean, or? Right, compared to what happened to you before, right. Yeah. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's less, it's a, it's a layer of, of concern. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a built in layer of safety. You know, and in that sense, there is some relief in that. I mean, there's so like I, I don't have to, um, not something I have to gauge or be concerned about so much when it's on a computer screen, you know, so probably so. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here today. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ms. Friedman. Uh, Dr. Herwick? I don't have any questions, thanks. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jones? I don't have any questions at this time. Okay, thank you. And um, Mr. Rana Singh? I have no questions, Judge, thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, I believe that's all, those are all of the uh, board members that we have present today. I will ask um, just, yes. There's one more board member, Strack, but I also don't have any questions. I, I apologize, Ms. Strack, thank you. That's okay, thank you. So I will ask just generally, do any of the board members who maybe asked questions earlier have any follow-up questions? And if you could speak up if you do. Okay, hearing hearing nothing, Mr. Steinheimer, do you have any follow-up questions uh, for Dr. Willison? Uh, I do not, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Willison, um, since you've answered all the questions uh, by the, the Deputy Attorney General and the board members, is there anything any final statement you would like to add for the board's consideration? Just to um, appreciate for you know the opportunity to to present my petition and and um, and for your consideration. So just uh, thank you for the time. I guess is what I'm saying. Thank you, Dr. Willison. Um, Mr. Steinheimer, anything further before we close the record? Uh, nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. At this time, this case is deemed submitted and the record is closed. Ms. Mendoza, we can go off the record. Okay, thank you. Um, so at this time, Mr. Disposti, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. And then uh, I believe Judge Aspinwall is going to handle the last two petitions. Um, you Thanks. can ask Judge Aspinwall to contact me when you wanna go into closed session. I'm assuming it'll be this afternoon. Um, right. And I, and I can rejoin you at that time. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you, even for one case. Um, <laughs> so I will, 
I will recommend a 10 minutes break uh, for everyone. It's 9.50 right now. And if we can reconvene for our second petition at 10 a.m. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Ms. Mendoza, if you're still on the line, um, could I get an estimated page count from you? Sure, 35 pages and okay. I have an end count. Do we still have the quorum without Crystal at the moment, moderator? You have eight in attendance. So I believe we do. We have a quorum with eight. Yes, thank you, Christina, as well. So I would like to proceed and resume our uh, public hearing portion of this meeting. Good after, good morning still, everyone. Uh, my name is Max Disposi, board chair of the Board of Behavioral Sciences. We are resuming our public hearing portions of this uh, board meeting today. And I believe Judge Timothy Aspinwell will take over our second case. Your Honor? Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, Thank you all. Thank you, board members, and welcome to the members of the public. My name is Timothy Aspinwall. I am here to preside at this uh, particular hearing regarding the petition for reinstate, reinstatement filed by Joseph O'Toole. This is um, and, and case we are back on the record. So, court reporter present, we are back on the record, and I will say uh, we are uh, on the record in the matter of the petition for reinstatement um, filed by Joseph E. O'Toole, uh, case number 2002021001915. And a, a quorum is present. Um, and I just want to confirm that um, uh, earlier this morning, Deborah Brown was present. Jonathan Matt it was not present. Um, Jonathan Maddox was uh, not present, and um, John Sovic was not present. I now have it that um, Anthony Crystal is not present. And is there one more that's not present? Your Honor, this is. This is legal counsel Sabina Knight. I'm seeing Crystal Anthony on the panelist list. I'm just um, think she just logged back in, but I guess we can check with her. Crystal, are you here? I'm here. Okay, so uh, Crystal Anthony is present. Um, and the reason I'm wanting to clarify is because at the point where we began deliberations, only those who are present will be permitted to deliberate so your honor this is the moderator can we also check and make sure a member of that Casaris Willis is back with us she's logged in there I am I am back thank you thank okay you. so we do have a quorum all members are present except for uh, uh, Deborah Brown Jonathan Maddox and John so then, um, okay, and is the petitioner, Mr. O'Toole present? I don't see his picture up. This is the moderator, I have promoted him. Mr. O'Toole, if you could unmute your microphone and activate your camera, please. Like his camera is working on activating. Okay, Mr. O'Toole, we can now see you. Can you unmute your microphone so that we can also hear you? I can unmute you from this, and it looks like you may be having some trouble. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, but could you hear oh, me? We can hear you now. Thank you. 
Okay, great. You do sound a little distant. And it looks like your camera turned off. Okay, so there your camera's back on. Okay. You're a little faint, but I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Can you let's let's see how this goes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you're a little bit faint for us. So Mr. O'Toole, this is Judge Aspinwall. You will need to be sure to speak up um, and speak um, clearly and as loudly as possible um, when it is your turn to speak. Um, for one thing, the board members need to hear you and the court reporter needs to keep a transcript and she can only do so if she hears what we're saying. Um, and uh, to the court reporter, I would um, remind you to please feel free to interrupt and uh, ask for clarification if necessary to, um, to keep uh, and maintain a clear record. Okay, so I have a few words for you to begin with, um, Mr. O'Toole. And I'll let you get settled with your camera before you, I, I give you your orientation. Can you see me now? I can see you now. Okay, the, the voice, your voice is very low. Okay, can you hear me okay now? I can hear you a little better, yes. All right. So, um, do you hear me better now? Uh, just about the same. About the same. What, what... Okay. Hello. Okay, You're, uh, we still have you on camera now. So let me just tell okay. you, you are here on a petition for reinstatement of your license. It will be uh, Im important for you. The board will be interested to know what you have done since your license was revoked. Um, the board is not interested uh, so much in uh, relitigating uh, what led to your revocation. So the board, to, to put it uh, uh, concisely, the board is interested to know about your rehabilitation since the time of revocation and why it is and whether it is that you would be safe to return to practice at this point. Okay, so um, you have the right to call witnesses and present exhibits. Do you have any witnesses you wish to call to testify here? No, I don't. Okay. And the exhibits, there is an exhibit packet that the Deputy Attorney General appearing will bring into evidence. Do you have any exhibits beyond the petition and the attachments to the petition that you have already submitted? No, I don't. Okay. And you have the right to be present with an attorney. Uh, is it your wish to proceed without an attorney at this point? Yes, I do. Okay. So with that in mind, you're ready to proceed, correct? Yes, I am. Okay. So I will ask the Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Steinheimer, to uh, please give a summary of the case and present the exhibits. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, for the record, um, Andrew Steinheimer, Deputy Attorney General. I'm appearing on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people of the state of California. Uh, to begin with, I would like to have Mark for identification, um, and then I will offer into evidence uh, what will be called Exhibit 1, 
uh, which consists of the petition packet and accompanying documents. Copies of these documents have been provided to the board members as well as to the petitioner. Exhibit one uh, generally consists of the following. A memorandum outlining Mr. O'Toole's case. Uh, the petition for reinstatement dated June 3rd, 2020. Petitioner's supporting documentation, which includes a personal statement from the petitioner, uh, DMV records, a certificate of appreciation from 2004, and a board certification in clinical social work. Exhibit one also includes the default decision and order in BBS case number 200-2016-00-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0
Brooks moved out to Ventura. But in the meantime, six months earlier, longer, I closed my office in Garden Grove, which was shared with my wife at the time. And so whatever paperwork was sent to that office, I never received. Then I left the home, of course, because we put it up for sale, and I moved out to Ventura. I was first informed when that I, you know, violated the rules was that uh, I called to double check my license because I was planning to open this in Ventura. Mr. O'Toole? That's what I Mr. O'Toole? Yes, sir. You can, the, the board members can barely hear you, so you're going to have to work on your microphone. I'm having a hard time here myself hearing you guys. I'm not sure how to make it any louder. It says it's up all the way. Can you get closer to the microphone? So Mr. O'Toole, this is the moderator. There should be a, a setting option um, in WebEx. We're, we're trying to, it's difficult with the phone because I'm not familiar with how they look. Um, where you? Your Honor, can we go off the record and uh, fix the audio? For a moment. Yes, we are off the record. So on, so like on a computer, there is a drop, there's a, a menu that goes along with our mute and unmute button where there's a setting to turn up the volume within WebEx. That's what I'm trying to figure out how to direct you to. A, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the Android phones. Looking in my resources. Moderator. Moderator, this is Kelly Runnesinger. Can we confirm that Mr. O'Toole is actually using the speaker function on his phone and not the regular microphone? Say that again, please. Can we Mr. confirm that Mr. O'Toole? Yes. yes, Mr. O'Toole, do you have your phone turn the speaker turned on on your phone? Yes, I did. Okay. Is that any better? No. If I put my volume up, I can hear him fine. So if we put our volumes up, I think it helps hear him better too. Yes, and I think it makes it easier for me to hear board. And are you are you holding your phone in your hand? Yes, ma'am. Is perhaps maybe your finger or something covering up your microphone? No, I got it at the very end. Okay. It keeps going in and out, so. Yeah, you were a little staticky for a minute, so I think you could have a, a, a rough connection as well, perhaps. It's moderator, the, the chair here. Um, like uh, board member Crystal was saying, I know it's very difficult, but I don't want to speak for everybody. I'm able to hear it. I just have to pay extreme extreme attention if we if we while he talks so but he comes through so i don't know if it's a problem for the recorder somebody else here in the house how to turn up the volume on the phone louder okay if you just give me a minute well uh, this is judge aspen while i have been able to hear um if i listen closely i'm more concerned about the board members and the court reporter. So if there is a board member that can't hear, then we need to fix that. This is Christina. I'm I'm okay hearing him. Okay. Same here with the chair. Crystal, same. I'm okay. I'm just gonna turn the volume up. I'm okay if I turn my volume up. My concern is Cesar is webcasting this, and that might not be coming across the webcast very clearly. That that's a concern, but not not a not a primary concern from my perspective. Hi, this is Susan, and this is a dumb question, but I'm on a new computer, a Mac, which I'm not used to, and I don't even know where to turn up the volume. Where do you turn up the volume? 
Can, can I be that's, heard now? Yes. Yeah, that's actually better. Yes, thank you, God. <laughs> yeah, can much, you see me now? Much better. You yes, wait. we can. We can see and hear you. Oh, excellent. Oh, yeah. Okay. Member Friedman, Member Friedman, are you able to hear him better now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes, well, to continue, wait, if that's okay. Wait, are we ready sure. to go back on the record? Is the court reporter ready yeah. to go? Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we are back on the record after a short um, recess to uh, deal with some audio issues. The board members um, are present, the, the same board members uh, at the beginning of this hearing. And um, we are continuing on with uh, Mr. O'Toole's testimony. So please go ahead, pick up where you wish, Mr. O'Toole. Yes, okay. Um... In 2016, I went to AA and I, through the DUI classes, uh, paid all the fines and fees. Attendance at the classes was 100%. Um, I don't have a lot of justification or understand, you know, to be able to state that this happened and that caused that, because I do believe that there are no excuses for drinking and driving. You know, your house could burn down. That doesn't warrant you getting in a car after drinking and driving. And I really ruminated on that in the beginning because God forbid if I would have hurt somebody, um, that would be for my life. I would never get over it. So I continue with AA um, on and off until the pandemic began. And during the pandemic, they closed down almost all of the places of AA meetings. And so that kind of drifted away. But I do have a background in my own private practice for dealing with drugs and alcohol, and also did research in Russia on drugs and alcohol. So that was a big focus of my life for many years. But the divorce and other things happening um, just put my mind in a very cloudy place at that point in my life. And once I spoke to my uh, probation analyst, Craig Zimmerman, he made it clear you know, that my license was revoked and I'd take three years. And after I had a chance to let the dust settle, I realized that he was right, you know, and my goal from then on was either to get depressed or come back. And I chose coming back. And so I did not violate any of the rules during my three year probation. I was in contact with Craig, you know, on a monthly basis, if not more often at times, he was very supportive and informative and, uh, the thing is, I did something wrong. I know I did something wrong, and I have no justification because I don't believe there's one. Oh, so I think that pretty much sums it up if there's questions. Okay, Mr. Steinheimer, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. O'Toole, um, if your license is reinstated, uh, what type of work would you intend to pursue? It would probably be more um, working in a hospital, like volunteering to do things, especially during the pandemic as it's coming hopefully to somewhat of an end, um, and then maybe part-time work. I'm not interested right now in going into full-time, uh, but that could grow as time moves on. I love the work I've done. And as you see, I was practiced since 1982 and I don't have any black marks on my record all the way through there. And if you look at my motor vehicle record, you'll see that I didn't have any black marks on that either until that event that occurred that evening. And uh, it woke me up is what it did. You know, I kind of was in a denial phase um, trying to reconnect or connect to a new group since losing the, my marriage of 19 years. It was a whole nother lifestyle. And, uh, and it put a period at the end of the sentence. I started to realize that this is not what I want. 
at all. And so I tried to open a practice here in Ventura. And during that period, although my membership with NASW was updated, my liability insurance was updated, my board certified diplomat was updated, um, I took for granted that everything, my license was updated and everything from my move was in storage. So I thought initially, okay, it must be stuck in storage. And uh, it wasn't, and I called the board and that's when I was informed. And uh, since my office was closed, I never did receive the paperwork because I would have responded right away. Um, okay, thank you. Um, with respect to AA, um, you testified that you have been in and out of AA. Do you maintain a sobriety date and do you continue to abstain from alcohol or drugs? Yeah, I haven't drank in three years. Okay, and then you indicated that you had trouble uh, attending AA because everything was closed. Have you yes. attempted to look for AA meetings online um, that you could attend? No, I have. No, I was never familiar with online before, and it felt so um, unpersonable. I mean, it just was kind of distance and cold. So I do have a friend that I would call who was also in AA, and we would talk if that became it. But, you know, prior to this event, you know, by a couple of weeks, you know, I wasn't drinking. That was not an issue for me. So I messed up. I was brought to the sunlight by Craig Zimmerman uh, of what I did, and I agree with him, you know. I agree with him in the beginning. I wish it wasn't happening, but I agree with him in the very beginning because you should not drive and drink. There's no excuse for it. I don't have one. You know, I could say that it was a divorce. My siblings died. I could come up with a whole bunch of stuff, but none of that justifies what I did. And it could have been so much worse if I would have hurt somebody. I would have never gotten over it. Never. Thank you, um, Mr. O'Toole. Yes, sir. At times when a board, when the board states a license that's been revoked, uh, particularly one that's been revoked for, um, you know, drinking or drug related issues, uh, they may place the license, the reinstated license on probation. If the board is going to reinstate your license, place you on probation, would you be willing to comply with the, any probation terms that the board um, imposes on your reinstated license? Well, what I have to do, I have to do. But I do believe the three years of working with my probation officer, um, it's very clear that I did not violate any of the rules or regulations during that period. And I thought that is my probationary period. Um, I did not work at all in the field of social work or anything associated with that. And it was times I wanted to volunteer, but you know, it was best I did not volunteer because that could bring up a million questions. And I just want to clarify the probation you're talking about. Was that criminal probation that was imposed by the Superior Court for the DUI? No. Uh. Uh. What type no, of probation? I'm saying, yeah, I'm just saying my only interpretation of probation was that's what I was on for three years already, or over three, so not maybe four years, um, and I, I was perfect. I was squeaky clean. I didn't do anything wrong. And if you look at my record, you'll see that for a gillion years, I have not done anything wrong. You know, I'm getting older now. And, uh, you know, probation and all that is, you know, it's just too stressful. I work so hard to get my license, building cars on a assembly line uh, for years, going to different schools for years, work going in the evening and the daytime at the same day, on the same day. Um, it was a great achievement for me. I was married when I was 17 and uh, that lasted for 13 years. And I have two children from that. But being uh, extended on a period of probation, I think I've already proved that I'm not drinking nor driving drinking. And if I was to drive under those circumstances, which is not going to happen, I would turn the license in myself.
did I answer your question? Uh, yes, uh, you did. Thank you. Um, I, I think that's all the questions I have, Your Honor. I'll turn it over to the board for questioning of Mr. O'Toole. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Steinheimer. Now it's time for board members to ask you uh, questions, uh, Mr. O'Toole. And uh, okay. first, I go to um, uh, Mr. Disposti. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Rotuls. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, I uh, it, this is obviously for the public of safe uh, of safety protection. Um, so, how would you? Because you, you are obviously sharing with us that this has been an isolated event, and that you uh, pretty much. Um, you made a change ever since this has occurred a few years ago. You say you have been sober for three years, right? Yes. Uh, has this event, um, do you self-identify as an alcoholic? Mm, I could, but I don't. Um, since I don't drink, I don't classify it, but I would certainly be put into it, uh, you know, I'm subject to addiction. I'm an Irish Catholic, and I came from a long line of Irish, and uh, that was very pronounced in growing up, was drinking. Okay. Um, so, so what? how can we assure the public, for instance, because, you know, uh, you know, addiction to alcohol, or oh, not addiction, I mean, relationship with alcohol sometimes are as uh, come and go, right? It could be one time we really get really drunk and we commit actions that we regret and then it doesn't happen for 10 years and that happens and again and then there are other people that you know they deal with that daily so how can we be assured for the for the public for the sake of the public protection that this will never happen again i mean we we heard you uh, obviously you were very clear about the fact that this was you know an act that shouldn't have occurred but what what did you put in place in order to besides going to AA, what kind of support system you have around you? How could you assure us that there is protections around your practice? And, and, and you know, we cannot restrict your license in a way uh, that you can practice with certain people versus others. Once your license is it's guaranteed, you're free to go. Yes. And yes. so how can you guarantee the public that um, there is a system of place where uh, this will never occur again? So if you can elaborate a little bit more about that, I think that would be very helpful. Yes, I, I, I think I have a strong family support who is aware of my loss of my license. And um, and so they I, they would definitely flip out if I was to take a drink or something um, because they know how important it is to get my license back and also that I normally don't drink. You know, there's just other ways to take care of things. I exercise a lot. Um, I go to the gym or did so in the past um, three or four times a week. So that was my main big outlet. I have a gym here at my home and so I can work out there. I do have people I can call who I know from AA that I could talk to if there was a problem. But the key thing in me, it's always been ingrained in me that you don't drink and drive and that drinking is not good for me and it's not it's just not good for me uh, nothing good comes from it and the people i associate with it it's people who drink get so artificial everybody's very friendly but it's just total artificial and i realized that um i was very much my house is filled with 12-step books and uh, alcohol uh, treatment programs and drug treatment programs and how to deal with that which i used in my practice for years um, with people who are having those problems and uh, i would be quite easy to go back to aa as soon as this pandemic ends or go on the, the computer um, to to stay connected to aa you know, um, I don't want to be in denial of uh, potential drinking. I can't, you know, there are no guarantees in life. I don't know if I'll be around in a year or two years. Um, but drinking, I don't have craving for drinking. I don't wake up in the morning thinking about a drink. I don't go to bed at night thinking about a drink. Um, I have the ability to talk to, to family members. And my grandsons now are all older. You know, they're the youngest one now is 18. So 
my daughter's here, her husband's here. It's, you know, I have a good, my, even my ex-wife I talk to often. And uh, she knows how important this is. And she knows that I didn't dr normally drink. And one of the first things they said, what are you doing drinking? It's like, I don't know. I was trying to connect to people. And uh, it's kind of started off where you, you go to dinner and people pour something in your glass, you know, and next thing you know, you're taking a sip of it. And you seem to be able to connect more with other people at times that way because they're in a certain state. But uh, I have many support systems that I can utilize to stay away from drinking if that was the issue. And uh, but I know drinking and driving will never occur. You know, I can't guarantee what's going to happen with alcohol. I don't believe I'm going to drink at all. I have no craving to do that. But uh, it's just so important to me. That's why I have no big defense here. You know, I was wrong. Um, I received a DUI, went to all the classes, went to AA, uh, met a lot of nice people in AA. You know, as long as they're not drinking, they're all wonderful. So it's a good support system. And I love living without, I don't see any purpose to it, actually. But I think coming out of a divorce that was, and moving, relocating, trying to live in a motel while I was locally trying to find an apartment to stay in, um, I didn't know what to do. I was lost. I was just lost. And uh, when this did occur, you know, I did search and find positive things that did occur to put a, you know, a period at the end of the sentence. You know, it's like, this doesn't go on. It can't go on. It does me no good. I don't find any joy in drinking. Okay, Mr. Otto, thank you so much for answering. I appreciate that. Um, I don't have any further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Christina Wong, any questions? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. O'Toole. Um, good morning. Good morning. So um, I want to follow up on you know your um, um, you know, your uh, earlier mentioned about your uh, sobriety year. You know you said that you haven't you haven't uh, taken a drink for three years. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. And so can I safely say that it's right around? Would you say it's 2017 or 2018? That it uh, the date began, I would say it's uh -huh. 2016. So if it's 2016, it will be five years. Yeah, okay, then it's longer than that. <laughs> then it's more than three years. Okay. But I just know that I could get reinstated in three years. And August 9th was my third year uh, of being suspended. So, you know, we back that up. It comes to 2016, 2017, something in there. But since the incident, I have not, I have not been drinking or or drank. Okay. I don't, um, even, yeah. I don't even like the taste of it. <laughs> so, you know, it's one of those things you have to force. Okay. And, uh, so, okay. so just clarify. So then, you know, after your two incidents of, you know, driving under the influence and, you know, or the last incidents of driving under the influence, and that is back in um, August 2000, actually it's January 2016, you haven't taken a drink, not during your criminal probation time. That's right. As soon as I found out that that was, and I think I found out in January, and that put the stop to everything. But I wasn't drinking in between either. I mean, like I'm saying, it's not it was not an issue for me. I just have no desire to drink. So it's not like a big achievement. It's just fortunately that's not something that I want to do. Or like you know, some people have to overeat. I don't. It's I don't have that feeling to overeat. Okay. It's not any great skill that I'm maintaining. Um, it's just it's not there for me. Okay. And I did have a lot of research with alcoholism and drug addiction. And you mentioned my uh, drug addiction. That is not accurate. That was never charged. It was dropped. Um, I was not drinking. And the only medication in my system, which I informed the police right in the very beginning, was that, you know, 
was prescribed by my heart doctor. I mean, that was pretty much it. And it was because I had a large heart at that time, which I didn't know until all this dust right. kind of cleared. Yeah. Well, thanks for the clarification. And so now, you know, and it looks like during that time, you know, for, you know, the incidents that um, you were under a lot of life So, yes. Yes, you know, you have death in the family, you got divorced, you have to relocate. So now, you know, so obviously the stress really getting, you know, getting you, um, you know, to kind of make you, you know, not really functioning well. And so on this line, I, I want to, you know, check with you to see how you're dealing with your life stressor now. Looks like life is good, but then... Yeah. You know, you can't, you, nobody can guarantee that, you know, that there is no stress in life. So how do you deal with your stress? And how do you make sure that, you know, the stress is also not influencing, you know, your your um, safety practice? Yes. Well, I do a lot of breathing techniques and meditation, which helps. I love to walk, which helps. And so there's a lot of those things that are more physical or mental that I find much more rewarding. My stress is greatly reduced. I think the divorce on top of the deaths um, was the end of a chapter that I was not prepared to see end. And uh, and it did end. And you're kind of lost. You know, you're just out like in a boat by yourself in the ocean. It's like, how do you get this feeling out of you of loss? It was just tremendous. And today... I still in contact with her and we have a very cordial relationship and things work out fine now. I have no strong desire to be in a romantic relationship at this time. If one occurred, okay, that would be beautiful, but that's not my drive. That's not what I'm interested in. My business is what I'm interested in. I love working with my clients, patients over the years and i've had a lot of opportunities to do researches in other directions like the one i spoke about in russia um which was just wonderful or the you know african research that i did although i didn't publish a paper i did with the russian one um it's just ex extremely wonderful it's i travel a lot and i find that so rewarding um but if you know you're traveling and drinking you don't remember traveling so it's not something i'm interested in so my question also you know you you sought out you know you you did seek out um counseling um yes. for yourself to deal with the stress you know and yes. it looks like it's pretty short term and so why yes. didn't you continue on counseling um basically it was short-term therapy it was through kaiser and I didn't, I did get a lot of information from it with the reflective type of quality feedback I would get, but um, it just wasn't worth it to me. It just didn't work well for me. And that I knew that I needed to go out and, and face this by myself in a lot of ways with the help of my family and others. Um, to live life properly is the best reward and the best strengthening technique I could come up with. Um, I'm not opposed to going to therapy. That's That would be fine. I just have to find the right therapist. And doing therapy over a computer is foreign to me. That doesn't mean I wouldn't do it, but. Okay. All right, sounds very good. Thank you so much. And I have no more question, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Crystal Anthony, do you have any questions? Um, I just want to thank Mr. O'Toole for being here. And also, I feel like you carry a lot of wisdom and that doesn't go unnoticed. And I like your very matter of factness. Um, the fact that things happen in our lives and sometimes people think that there it's like further than that and really it's you're very matter of fact and I just wanted to tell you that I really appreciate how genuine you are in regards to the fact that you recognize what the safety issue is to the public which is drinking and driving yeah. and um and so I can appreciate that and um 
And I'm thinking like a therapist for a second. It's easy to want to diagnose somebody with a substance abuse disorder, but sometimes people don't actually qualify for that. So anywho, um, that was my thought out loud. Um, I want to thank you for today. Thank you, man. Thank I really you. appreciate your words. Can you repeat that, mm -hmm. Your Honor? Yeah. You're coming across really fuzzy. Is anyone else hearing that? Yes, I agree. Yes. Yes. On yep. my end too. I'm not sure that I'm still coming across. Judge, I think your, your boom mic might be, uh, might be up, sir. There you go. Is this any better? Still crackly. No. Yes, it is still crackly. More so than before, so it didn't change. Maybe try unplugging your headset and plugging it back in. Sometimes I have to do that. Can you hear me better now? Much yeah. better. Yeah. How about now? Much better here. Still Much better. better. Okay. That's good. So that was it. Plug in and unplugging. Um, Okay, so I was asking whether um, uh, Yvette Willis has any questions. Yes, you got okay. that to Sarah Solis. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I don't, I don't have a question. I also too just wanted to thank uh, Mr. O'Toole for um, owning up to this uh, this situation. I know um, it is a difficult. Um, Thing to go through. So I just wanted to um, also express uh, my gratitude for him not um, wanting to blame others for what he has done. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, Ross Ehrlich. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Toole, for being here. I have no actually questions for you. I wanted to sort of reiterate the comments made by board member Anthony and I do appreciate your matter of factness um, and your genuineness. So thank you for being here and thank you for um, your testimony. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Friedman. Yes, I do have a question. Am I unmuted? Um, I can see Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Mr. O'Toole, thank you very, very much for being here and for telling us some very, very interesting things about your life. The, the one thing I'm, I'm just a bit curious about is what have you been doing while you haven't had the license? I, I basically have been living off retirement is what I have been doing. I sold my house, of course, and I split that with my wife. And, uh, and that gave me finances to kind of hang on, but then also Social Security came and my retirement package came. So I was fortunate enough to have some money, not enough money, of course, but some money to be able to exist. I did not want to risk one step uh, of touching the field that might be interpreted as social work or being in the psychotherapy or anything like that. Um, I'm cognizant of my vulnerabilities. And I think that's one of the best defenses or support system one can have. I understand when I'm on, under stress that I don't, my, one of my options, I could do push-ups, I could go for a walk, I could do this and that. One of them that I don't do is drink. There's no joy in it. Um, when you, when you um, mentioned the problems that you have with, with generally speaking with, with money, is that why you continue to pay your dues so late every single month for several years on your <laughs> license? Yes. Well, my license has been revoked. So, you know, I didn't know I was supposed to pay on that during this revoke period because I was not acting as a clinical social worker. Um, but I certainly could pay that forward if that's something that's outstanding. Because after we finish this, if I am 
gifted with the idea of being able to get my license back, I have to reconnect with NASW, who I've been in contact on and off some of this period of time, and uh, and find out what the requirements are that I'm going to have to deal with there and pay whatever things I have. I tried to keep the uh, NAS Day membership active. Uh, I have not kept the liability insurance because of the money I do receive. Uh, so, yes, I guess that does have an impact on my license and stuff. I thought I paid it for the whole year, but I could find out differently. So, if you were to um, get your license back, how would you imagine your practice to be? What do you think you would be doing, considering well, exactly what the times are right now? Yes, I think initially I'd like to volunteer because I've had experience with it. Like I worked in the city of Hope for a couple of years where uh, people have a year or less to live in most cases. And so um, there's just so many aspects of this this license. I mean, you can do so many things that are helpful for people. You could be so supportive and you could also make them safe you know, by not having a dual relationship or stepping in that area at all or uh, anything like that, uh, sexual contact. And uh, and uh, if you look at my license, I don't have any of that stuff. My big fall down was drinking and driving. I mean, that's what I did. Did I answer your question? I'm sorry, I could have went off on a tangent. Well, I think you did. You said you would be doing some volunteer work. Yeah, so, volunteer work and part-time private practice. Um, and then based on that, you know, if I would want to expand it, if things were going well, um, other therapists I talk to find it a little bit awkward dealing with it on a computer screen because that's not something they're used to. And I think they are a little critical of being able to see facial expressions or skin tone changes or eye dilations uh, that may give signals off to certain questions that are asked or things that are being discussed. Um, some people feel that's omitted. And I think, I think in some ways that's true. I think person to person is one of the best aspects of our business. Um, being in the same space and people being able to connect to one another uh, versus through a computer where you're almost making a connection with the computer and then to the therapist or to the client. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Okay, um, Diana Herwick, do you have questions? Nope, I don't have any questions. Thanks very much, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Jones. Hi, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, thank you for, for being here today. Um, when you, just on a, on a funny note, when uh, when you mentioned that, that you didn't get a, a ton out of the therapy um, uh, experience, I remember a quote from uh, Sigmund Freud that said that, uh, psycho and psychoanalysis was always wasted on the Irish. Um, so I, I, I always find that funny. Um, I, I do have uh, just a, a couple of questions. Should um, you know? Should should your license be reinstated? Um, you know, uh, you you've mentioned um, the the difficulty that you've had to transition to the telehealth, and I think that that uh, a lot of us have felt that way. Um, but being that you've been out of practice for three years, what sort of supports do you think you, that you might need? To get back up to speed uh, with regards to um, you know to engaging in uh, you know in a clinical practice again. Yes, well, I, I'm a voracious reader, and I have a ton of books all directed to uh, social work and mental health, and so I oftentimes read them. I've been a little preoccupied lately with the Trump stuff, and reading about him, and I actually knew of him on the East Coast when I was growing up, and. I won't give you my opinion at this point, uh, but I'm more than willing to reach out uh, to groups. I'm involved with groups that I used to be involved with. We would meet monthly as clinicians and uh, 
you know, discuss different cases and what things were happening and how they were handling this or what, what feedback you could give, keeping all the confidentiality issues in mind. Um, and that was quite rewarding. And that's something I would definitely go back. And I've been in touch with them on and off. But again, like I said, I was really concerned about overstepping my boundaries and getting involved in social work in some form. And this was clinicians. Um, I just didn't want anything that was going to disrupt this. I disrupted it, which caused all this. And I need to make it solid again. Um, people are safe with me and people will be safe with me. And if that was ever to turn in my mind, I would definitely, I would have to give up my license or stop private practice. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Okay. Uh, Kelly Rana Singh. Any questions? Is Kelly Rana Singh present? This is the moderator. Kelly, it looks like your microphone is unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Um, if you're connected by phone and computer, make sure your phone is unmuted and you're controlling your microphone by your computer. Hi, folks. Can you hear me now? We can. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, I, I'm sorry. Um, I just had one quick question. Did you sure. say you were living in the City of Hope? No, I wasn't living in the City of Hope. I worked in the City of Hope, and I actually okay. lived off grounds in a little cabin. Got it. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'm just making sure my notes are accurate. That's it. No further questions. And I echo Ms. Anthony's comments. Thank you for all of your very upfront testimony. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Okay. Wendy Strack, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, just one hopefully quick question. Um, also want to echo my fellow board members' comments about your openness and honesty and just appreciate um, your forthrightness with us. Um, I think the DAG asked you early on about whether you'd be willing to go through a probationary process with a license reinstatement. And with some of the board members' questions that you've heard, um, kind of how do you feel about that process? Um, and, and is that something you would be open to? I like I stated initially was that the three plus years that I have been without license, I have, I think I have proven that as my probationary period. Uh, went to therapy, do a lot of readings, met with other people, went to AA, went through all the DUI classes that were mandated. Um, I handled the whole experience and my thing was through this three years and plus to my, the end of my life, um, I'm prepared for that, you know, I'm prepared for that. And probation is just a distraction in some ways for me getting my feet back under me. I still have a lot of work to do through NSAW. I'm sure there's going to be classes that I need to take with them, which are requirements normally every year. And I have to double check and see what that, what they're going to ask of me. Um, so that would be additional probation. Uh, through the NASW, but having it probation ex put on top of the three year revocation, uh, it's more of a distraction. I think it would be more pressure than I just want to be whole again. You know, I just want to be whole again. I just want to get this behind me and be able to move forth with my life, whatever remaining here. And uh, so, uh, probation is not a big wish for me. Okay, I appreciate your honesty on that. Thank you. I, I don't have any other questions. Okay. Um, that, uh, that concludes the questions from the board members present. Uh, they may have follow-up questions. I'm going to give um, an opportunity for uh, Mr. Steinheimer, the Deputy Attorney General, to ask any questions he may have. Mr. Steinheimer, any follow-up questions? Uh, no, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
turning back to the um, the board, do any of you have any um, questions? And feel free to just speak up if any of you have any follow up questions. Hearing none, um, Mr. O'Toole, this is your time to give any final statement that you may wish to give to the board, having heard their questions um, and the Deputy Attorney General's questions. Is there anything you would like to say in conclusion? No, I just, I'd like to just underline the fact that there is no excuse uh, for whatever's going on in your life to drink and drive. I mean, that's just that's just the rule of thumb. It's like you don't go to the bathroom out in the middle of the street. That's maybe a terrible example. Uh, but uh, no, I think that is it. I would like to say that uh, I was quite anxious about this meeting and everyone there uh, made it much less confrontative. Uh, I almost can say I enjoyed it. and. Uh, so I wish you all the best of luck in, in your futures and, and your health and remember to get a shot when you can. And uh, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Okay, and thank you. And um, Mr. Steinheimer, do you have any final statement you wish to make? I don't, Your Honor. I would submit on this. Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, then the matter is submitted. I will prepare a written decision within 30 days and then forward it to the board. They will ultimately forward it to you. Um, okay. The case is submitted. The record is closed and we are off the record in this matter. And Ms. Mendoza, can you tell me how many pages? 36 pages, Your Honor. Okay, Your Honor, thank you. Max Disposi here, the board chair. I will ask for um, a little break before we go to our next petitioners, which is Melissa Jones. And I'm assuming my fellow board member would like to have then a lunch break after our last petitioner before we go into closed session. So um, I will ask to resume our work at 11. It's 11.03 right now. Uh, we can resume at 11.15 and back for our next petition. Thank you so much. Back into our um, Board of Behavioral Science. Uh, today is March 4th, 11, 18 a.m. My name is Max Disposi. I'm the board chair, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, we're moving out to our next petitioner. And under uh, Judge, um, oh, Aspinwall, <laughs> Your Honor, yeah. it's your turn. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yes, we are back on the record, um, and the record should show a quorum is present. We are here in the matter of the petition for early termination of probation filed by Melissa Lynn Crawley. This is case number 2002017. 000331. My name again is Timothy Aspinwall. Um, and do we have Ms. Crawley present? I don't see her picture. This is the moderator. I did promote her to a panelist. Okay. Ms. Crawley, if you could speak up, then we will see your picture. I do not see that she's activated her camera yet. Ms. Crawley, if you can hear us, can you unmute your microphone? Is it unmuted? It is unmuted. Can and then see? I'll, not yet. Sometimes it takes a second for the camera to activate. Once you've hit the start video button, then it might take just a brief pause to, for it to show. 
I don't see that your camera is activated yet, though. I'm not seeing where to put. We can go off the record while we're until we have the audio visual. So are you on a phone? A no, okay, I see. I'm, on, I'm on a computer. Can, you can't see me? I we see it coming video. through now. OK. OK. Uh, yes. And also, um, Your Honor, if I could just check one more time. Uh, Member Friedman, have you returned? Are you with us? I'm here. Thank you. Great. And so we have a full quorum with uh, Member Friedman present. And thank you for checking, um, Madam Moderator. OK, so um, Ms. Friedman, I, I want to give you, a, this is Judge Aspinwall, I want to give you a short orientation on how this will proceed today. Um, first of all, um, you have the right to present witnesses and exhibits. Um, are you going to call any witnesses other than yourself to testify today? No, just myself. Okay. And do you have any exhibits you wish to present other than um, the items that the Deputy Attorney General will be presenting, which include your petition and the attachments to your petition? Do you have any documents um, other than your petition and the attachments to it no your honor i should just have my quarterly reports and updated letters from my physician and my therapist to my supervisors well I, i'm not sure whether those are included in the okay. items that um that the uh were included in your petition or not and if you had subsequently submitted them have you subsequently submitted them to the board I haven't because I assumed that everybody would be reading them. So that's my mistake, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Okay. And so you have that you have uh, documents you wish to submit and tell me what are they again? Um, I, I don't have them with me, but I assumed that everybody had been reading my quarterly updated quarterly reports and updated letters from my therapist, my supervisor and my um, psychiatrist, which were included in my quarterly reports. That is from both the therapist and a psychiatrist? And a supervisor, yes. A therapist, a psychiatrist, and a supervisor? Yes. So what kind of supervisor? A work supervisor? No, she's my supervisor um, under my probation. Okay. Okay, and we will deal with that issue here. I want to ask um, uh, Mr. Disposti, who is the chair of the board, um, is there a typical way in which the board deals with, um, with, with this type of issue where the petitioner has documents that they have not yet submitted but would like to do so. I've dealt with this situation when we are uh, well, in person and, and the petitioner comes in with exhibits, then we'll photocopy them and circulate them. But here is it. Well, like, if I may interject, um, in my prior hearings, I believe the district attorney had submitted each member of the board with copies of my updated reports and letters and so this is virtual and it's different for me so i had assumed that they would have received those and, and it's okay that they didn't but it was just my assumption that they would have already read them 
So, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Uh, well, in general, I, I was going to go back to the file to make sure that these documents that uh, Ms. Jones referring to are there, but uh, perhaps our legal counsel can do a little uh, ch uh, check in. Usually, we do distribution of these documents, we take 10 minutes break, so we have a time to read it. Uh, if the documents were not distributed, but um, I'm letting Sabina, our legal counsel, to chime in on this. Sabina? Sure, sure. So if uh, what, whatever was um, submitted with a petition packet has been given to the board members, um, if there are additional, so if there are documents outside of that that you just thought they might have already, they don't have it. They're only given your petition packet. So if you want them to see other things, if you want to see other things today, um, we can get it to the, the Deputy Attorney General, and we can also get it to our board members and give them a slight break to review it. There's no, but that answers my question. That's perfect. And I'm sorry I'm taking up time with this. I see letters in there um, in the packet. Okay. Does there, I mean, everybody got those letters. Well, I, this is Judge Aspinwall. I'm not sure what... What letters are are the ones that um, Ms. To. Crawley is referring to as compared to the letters in the? There should just be a letter from my um, supervisor, my therapist, and my psychiatrist within the last nine months or so. Could you say the names of the um, like where they're coming from? There's one from yes. Sandy Pamela. Sandy John Pam Pamela Saint John. Yeah, and. Um, Sorry, my uh, psychiatrist. Uh, Kirk Meekins, yes. doctor. Okay. Can you can you spell those names, please? Yes, Doctor Meekins is M E E K I N S, and Sandy is S A N D I, John J O H N, and Pamela Saint John. S T J O H N. Thank those, you. Those uh -huh. are in the in the packet. They're under okay. the yep. petition. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry for holding you guys up for that. Yeah, I'm sorry. The chair here I, and whoever speaks, please identify yourself. Otherwise, I don't know who is actually making statements. Uh, board chair here, Max Disposti. Yes, it's confirmed that all those letters were already included in our package. So the board has received it promptly. So we can move on and move forward. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. It's all good. Thank you. Okay. This is Judge Aspinwall, and the court, uh, the, the quarterly reports are also there. Uh, that's a question, Mr. Uh, Mr. Um, just a, just as a as a side note, we um when you first petitioned two years ago, we did include some of that information. We don't um, include that now in the petitioner packet because some of it can be deemed confidential, and we don't want to. Uh, submit that with the petitioner packet. So that's where I think some of the confusion is. So sorry, Ms. Brown. No, oh, thank you for the clarification. Okay, so we are back to um, this short orientation for you, uh, Ms. Crawley. You do have the right to call witnesses. You've said you don't wish to call witnesses, that you have the right to offer documents. It sounds as if the documents that you wish to enter are already in the packet uh, provided to the board members. Um, that might become clearer as the Deputy Attorney General goes through the packet. Um, are you also aware that you have the right to be represented by an attorney in this matter? Yes, Your Honor. And it's your wish to go forward representing yourself at this point? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And this is your petition for early termination of probation. Um, the board is going to want to hear about uh, your rehabilitation since having been put on probation. Things okay. you have done to achieve rehabilitation. The board is not going to want to hear you relitigate the case that caused you to be on probation in the first instance. Okay. Okay. So, this, uh, we're, we're going to proceed first with the Deputy Attorney General presenting your case, then you'll have a chance 
to be sworn in and give a statement of your own. Then the Deputy Attorney General may ask you some questions and the board members will ask you some questions. At the conclusion of the hearing, you'll have an opportunity to make any final remarks um, based on the questions and any other material. So, do you have any questions of me at this point? No, I don't. Okay. And um, Mr. Uh, Steinheimer, would you like to uh, uh, state your appearance and uh, present the, uh, the uh, petition material? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Andrew Steinheimer, Deputy Attorney General. I'm appearing on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522. I'm representing the people of the state of California. First, I'd like to have Mark for identification, and then I'll offer it into the evidence. Uh, exhibit one, which is the uh, petition packet and accompanying documents. Uh, the board members and the petitioner have uh, been provided with a copy of the same set of exhibits. Uh, exhibit one generally consists of a memo outlining Ms. Crowley's case. Uh, Ms. Crowley's petition for early termination of probation dated July 1st, 2020. Uh, petitioner's supporting documentation, which consists of three letters, one from Sandy John, one from Pamela St. John, and one from Kirk Meekins. It includes the default decision and order in case MF-2009-1087 which was effective October 20th, 2010, includes the decision and order on petitioner's petition for reinstatement, which is identified as case number 2002 uh, which was effective January 25th, 2017. It includes a decision and order on petitioner's or a request to modify probation, which was effective April 11th, 2019. And then it includes a notice to appear at this petition hearing, as well as a petitioner's certification of license history. And I'd ask that this exhibit be admitted into evidence at this time, Your Honor. It is marked as exhibit one and admitted into evidence. Now I'd like to just give a brief history of um, uh, the petitioner's license. On or about October 29th, 2003, the board issued uh, the petitioner marriage and family therapist license number LMFT 40105. In May of 2010, the board filed an accusation against petitioner in case number MF 2009-1087. The accusation alleged that the petitioner was subject to discipline based on petitioner's conviction of a crime of making a criminal threat and the use of a firearm in, in the commission of a felony. Uh, the underlying facts were that the petitioner pointed a gun at a person's head and threatened to kill them. Petitioner failed to respond to the accusation and a default decision was entered effective October 20th, 2010, uh, revoking petitioner's license. In June of 2016, petitioner uh, petitioned for the reinstatement of her license. Her license was reinstated on January 25th, 2017, at which time it was placed on probation for a term of five years. The probation was told until June 4th, 2018, and the probation is now set to be completed on June 3rd, uh, 2023. On or about December 1st, 2018, petitioner petitioned for the reduction in her probation terms. And a few of her terms were modified and reduced uh, effective April 11th, 2019. The petitioner has been compliant with her probation and is now requesting that the board terminate her probation early. And I turn it back to you, Your Honor, for uh, Ms. Crowley's testimony. Thank you, Mr. Steinheimer. Okay, Ms. Crawley, at this point, it is your opportunity to testify on your own behalf. Um, I uh, 
remind you that the board is interested in hearing about your rehabilitation. Um, once I swear you in, you can proceed in a narrative format and then um, both Mr. Steinheimer and the board members will ask you some questions. So if you'll raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, please proceed. Okay, so I um, had gone over my re rehabilitation prior in my, in my, my other hearings, so I'm going to be a little fuzzy on this. The, the offense that I committed was in 2009, and I have done so much rehabilitation that I'm going to try to start from the beginning and go through it. Um, after the offense was committed, I had um, realized that I was having a manic episode and I put myself into inpatient hospitalization for about a week and a half to two weeks to stabilize on medication. And prior to the offense, I had been diagnosed with bipolar, but I wasn't really, um, I was in a lot of denial about it. So I wasn't really taking my medication as required. So I started working with a psychiatrist and I upped my therapy to twice a week. I also, after inpatient, went to an outpatient intensive program for four months. I also did um, electroconvulsive shock treatment for four months in an attempt to stabilize my mood. I tried numerous medications for the course of about a year and a half to get my mood stabilized, in which it did. And since that time, I've not had a manic or depressive episode. My, my letters and my reports and my um, documentation all indicate from my doctors that I have been in remission from, my, from um, bipolar for quite some time, for many years. Um, at that time, I, at the time of the offense, I was also abusing alcohol and going through a divorce and I left my husband at the time and went into AA and um, and got a sponsor and I was very involved with that. I also was mainly um, socializing with other mothers in a suburban neighborhood who we were all drinking quite heavily once or twice a week. Um, and so I moved out of the neighborhood, divorced my husband, and I reestablished a different support system for myself and, um, and still connected with my AA fellow um, members. I also took substance abuse classes and um, I've continued with my same therapist since 2006 or 2007 um, and I'm trying to meet with my psychiatrist regularly for my medication which has been consistent for a few years um, trying to think of what else um, I, I I don't I can't think of anything else at the moment anything else you wish to say at the moment before we, well, you get questions? Just that I have completely changed my lifestyle and at the time of the offense I don't know. I know some people on the board have seen me before and they knew that I was working at a juvenile detention facility with a with 10 hour days and a 45 minute commute and two young children and a very bad uh, marriage and then I had been um, starting to be stalked by a man who I had been working with, and that's when where the gun incident happened um, under all of that stress. And 
since that time, my lifestyle has completely changed. Um, I'm in a relationship with my boyfriend for the past four and a half years who doesn't drink and my friends don't drink. It's not a part of my lifestyle. Um, I'm very focused on raising my two teenage boys who are a lot of work and um, just trying to create that balance in my life. And, um, and manage my private practice. So I guess that's pretty much where I'm at. Okay, uh, Mr. Steinheimer, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, so Ms. Crilly, why are you petitioning, and, and maybe it's obvious, but why are you petitioning for early termination now, as opposed to just fulfilling the remainder of your probation? Well, I have heard from both my psychiatrist and my supervisor and my therapist that they feel that I'm ready to practice independently. And I also do feel like I'm ready to practice independently. Um, I've demonstrated consistency and stability for many, many years. Um, I've been sober since October 15th of 2012, and I continue to be involved in AA. I also um, have created a consultation group with other therapists. And in addition to that, my supervisor um, is planning to continue to work with me as I need her to. Um, and I plan on continuing with my therapy with my therapist. Um, I just feel that, you know, I've been through this past year, I my psychiatrist passed away and I've dealt with the pandemic and then we had the campfire here. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, where 20,000 or 27,000 people were affected with the campfire and I have a lot of those clients and I just want to be able to free up my time with going to random drug testing, which I also have to cancel clients during those days that I get tested, which it, it becomes inconvenient, obviously. Um, there's the cost of being on probation, which is approximately $500 a month, and I'm a single parent raising two teenage boys. Um, and I just would like more time freed up for me so I can be more available to clients and working with victim witness and um, to, to be quite honest, being on probation, it's it's anxiety provo provoking and I, I, I feel like I'm ready to work on my own. Uh, thank you. Sure. You indicated um, that you are still involved in AA. Um, can you explain, I guess, a little bit um, about the, the extent that you're involved with AA still? And then also, if your probation is terminated, do you intend to continue participating in AA, even if it's not a requirement? Absolutely. Um, some of my best friends now are um, in AA, and we go to meetings several times a month, and I also connect with my sponsor as I need to. And um, I just go as I need to, and I know that I am an alcoholic. I don't have any denial about that. And as I said, I involve people in my life that aren't participating in drinking. Um, but yeah, I do obviously continue. I want to continue to do that because it's a big part of my life right now. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Your Honor, I'll turn this over to questioning from the board. Thank you. So the board members will now ask you um, some questions. And um, Mr. Desposti, do you have questions? Yeah, just briefly one. Hi, Miss Crowley. It's so good to see you again. Um, it, uh, I was, uh, I remember when we met, I don't know how many months ago, it feels with COVID, it's hard to tell, but it's been a while, right? Less than a year or something, or? I think it's maybe? been more like two years. <laughs> oh my gosh, I felt like it was quicker. So, um, uh, for, for, from last, time we saw you um and and everything so do you 
I, I mean, I can hear you. I can see, you know, your testimony coming true and, and clear. How do you, uh, if you have to elaborate a little bit more, what has changed from the last time you came to the board, which we also modify your petition a little bit, right? We reduce some of the frequency. Am, am I correct? Yeah. And so, yeah. And and how, how do you think things have changed since the last time you were here? And so if you can elaborate a little bit more on that. And then uh, among all the terms of the probation, it seems I seems to hear, but maybe I'm wrong. That definitely the testing is one of the major hardship, right? Because of the timing and everything else. Yes. Um, so um, yeah, if you can el elaborate a little bit more about that, I would really really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm gonna try and re try and remember everything you said. So um, I think the biggest thing that's changed for me is. Um, I don't know if it's worth mentioning, but I'm co-parenting with my ex a lot better, which has reduced my stress level. But most importantly, I think I have a clear sense of balance. I'm not working too many hours and I'm running every morning and walking with girlfriends in the evening and seeing my boyfriend. And there's, there's just a lot more joy in my life. And it's, important for me to say that because the last year has been very difficult for me but even with the stressors i've been able to manage my mood and watch my mood and um and remain stable and i just think that is the biggest thing for me um trying to think of what else you asked me what was the last part of your question i can't recall so the last, I, I thank you for sharing that. You know, food, sure. by the way. I mean, being stable during COVID. I don't know if anyone, any of us, was able to do that. <laughs> you know, it's been a really hard year. Uh, no, I was just mentioning about. You know, we reduce some of the probation terms. If there is something, I, I, you know, this is not our offer. You know how this works. You've been here a yes. couple of times. So if you if you had to look about really slimming out you know your probation terms what are the things that you would like to definitely get rid of and, and maybe <laughs> if we decide to keep in place i know you're here for a whole termination so i'm I not know, negotiating with you so please I know. Me. right it's more about understanding you know what are the major obstacles within the probation and it appears to be the frequent testing so i wanted to hear a little bit if if yeah. you were were I willing know. to uh, yeah. So I'm going to be very honest about this. Please. Um, yeah, which is probably something that people are not aware of when they don't have to drug test. But I call in 365 days a year. So every morning when I call in, my anxiety goes up because I know that I have a full day of taking my kids to school, picking them up, taking them to sports and having clients. And I know that if I have to test, I'm going to have to at least cancel two clients, which financially is hard, but it's also hard on the clients because they don't understand. So there's that. And then um, it's not easy to prepare for a drug test. I mean, people think you just walk in, take a drug test and you leave, but it's, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but um, it's hours of preparation to make sure that you can meet that requirement of that drug test. And, um, and it is a financial hardship too. Um, it's, it's just very stressful for me. Um, so that's one. The supervision and the therapy, um, it's not that big a deal because I'm planning to do it anyways. So, um, but I would like to be able to do it on um, and on more of an on needed as needed because it is costing me $400 a month just to go to supervision and therapy per month. So there's a big financial burden for me. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you for, us, for answering so thoroughly and um, I, I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate your honesty. So thank you so much. Not not further questions, Your Honor. And thank yes, you. thank you. Okay, um, Christina Wong. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Hi. I think I am. Hi, I think I'm one of those. Like I see you. Like 
the third time. <laughs> the third time, yes, I remember you. <laughs> right, right. So, well, thanks so much. You know that uh, this is a different forum compared to how we see us, you know, last time. But I yeah. definitely, you know, can you know can see the change in you, which is wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, so I just want, you know, would like for you to elaborate a little bit more, you know, when you, you know, in your testimony, you know, you did say that uh, um, you feel like, uh, and your therapist and your psychiatrist, you know, felt that, you know, you're ready. And so, you know, so ready to, you know, to take on, I suppose, to take on more. And so I just really want you to, you know, to maybe instead of just listing all these stuff that you have done, you know, you, in what areas that you really feel that you're already. Now, I think I remember last time I did tell you that you're the super mom, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, you know, and so you're still being a super mom, right? You know, have your schedule done. So in that sense, you know, what area that you feel that you really can practice independently, you know, with that title of super mom, um, yeah. <laughs> Well, okay, so ironically, ironically, I specialize in teenagers. I specialize from 10 years, 10 years old to 25. And I, I'm not sure how to answer this question other than I love my job. It does not feel like a job. And I genuinely feel like I'm helping these kids and their parents. And I feel confident and ready every day that I go to work. Um, if something comes up, I can run it by a colleague as I need to. Um, but most of the time, I feel like I'm on track and I'm I'm doing my therapy the way I need to, and I'm maintaining my boundaries with them, and I'm monitoring my countertransference, which is something I've really worked on. Um, it's been a big change for me to sit and monitor my countertransference and be able to journal about it and talk about it. Um, but I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but um, I just feel like I, le I need less guidance, that I, I trust myself more and I believe in my ability more because when this all happened, I was very ashamed. It was all over the news. Um, I'm actually dating the mayor now and I had to tell him what I did, which was, it was very humiliating. Um, but I've come to a place where I've accepted my mistakes and I've grown from it and I, you know, I own it and it's made me a different person. It's humbled me. Um, I don't know. I just, I feel like I've healed a lot. I feel like I've healed a lot. So you did answer my question. <laughs> No, because really, you know, I think rehabilitation is not about what you do. It really is about the mentality. And so I can really see that, you know, when you touch on that area, talking about like monitoring your counter transference, um, you know, really be aware of the boundary. And I can really see that your passion. So, you know, of helping teenagers and their parents, mm -hmm. you know, which is really, you know, important in that sense. So the, then the follow up question is that since you are planning on to continue on um, supervision and individual counseling, don't give me the details, but I just want to know what you're going to work on <laughs> since you're already pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the main <laughs> thing that I've learned is that it's, it's almost like, um, representative representative of bipolar it's i need to maintain this balance of work and pleasure and having you know that balance and so that's the main thing that i work on and also it's it is the counter transference i have to be i have to know what's coming up for me when these teenagers are talking about their family issues and make sure that i'm not putting my own agenda on onto them so those are the two main things, and re I think I like my consultation team that I have outside of my um, supervisor because we're able to refer each other, our clients, based on scope of competence and practice and stuff. So those are the things I would continue to work on. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, what you said actually represented all clinicians. 
you know, <laughs> that's what they need to do because, yeah. you know, when you're behind a closed door, that is exactly what we need to continuously to monitor. Yeah. So, congratulations that you have come so far and thank I just really enjoy having your presence here. So thank you so much. Thank you. No more question, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Crystal Anthony, do you have questions? Um, I don't have any questions. Thank you for being here today. Um, and I agree your presence. I can kind of just tell there's been growth um, by when somebody carries themselves and doing these enough, you can kind of see when the change kind of like reflects even just like um, like your aura and energy. So uh, thank, you. thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Yvette Casares willis do you have questions? Hi, can you see me? We can see you, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Crowley, thank you for um, your testimony. I do have one question. When you are working um, with your, um, I guess, your clients, the teenagers, I'm assuming through all of the pandemic, you're doing it virtually. Are you, are you doing, are you, are you seeing them face to face? I am seeing some um, clients and families virtually, but the majority I'm seeing in person with mas masks on six feet apart. That's the way my building, um, we sort of set that protocol up to wear masks and have social distancing, but that's mainly how I'm um, working in addition to virtual. So I'm kind of doing both. Okay, and it sounds like um, with your medications, you've been able to kind of keep the bipolar um, disorder under control. Um, are there some days that are harder than others? Um, is the medication really something that you depend on to have a really, you know, strong, positive day? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, I... <laughs> I have bipolar and I, you know, it's a lifetime, a lifelong thing and I will be on medication the rest of my life. I'm convinced. And, um, I take it every day. Um, I have backup medication. My doctor gives me in case I'm not sleeping because if I don't sleep, that's always the first sign for me that something's, you know, I need to be aware of, but, um, yeah, I do think I need the medication, the mood stabilizer. I do. And I, I don't know if I'm answering your question too, but you know, I have good days and bad days. So um, on my bad days, I just, you know, like to come home and, and just relax and not talk to people in general, just kind of get into my own um, self or watch a movie or something to decompress. No, I appreciate your honesty. I think it's important to recognize and understand how you know to treat what you're going through and to to like when you said that you think you'll be on medication forever then you understand that and you'll take it responsibly so thank you i appreciate your your answers and thank you for being here today thank you okay i have no further questions thank you your honor well thank you and uh ross ehrlich do you have questions <clears throat> Uh, yes, thank you, Your Honor. Just one quick one. And uh, Ms. Crowley, thank you again. I wanted to kind of reiterate, um, I'm very impressed today with the sort of directness of your testimony, um, your candor, um, thoughtfulness of your answers. So I appreciate that. Um, on my bad days, I like to come home and not talk to anyone as well. So uh, <laughs> uh, definitely with you on that. Um, really quickly, I, I, it, I think I answered my own question. I saw in your notes, you, you did get this conviction expunged is that correct i did i got it expunged and i want to say in 2015 yes yeah okay. uh, yes um okay that's really all the questions i have so i uh, appreciate you being here today thank you thank you okay uh, susan friedman do you have any questions i have just one thank you thank you thank you for being here it's been really great having you and hearing you progress and what's been happening. The only thing that I wanted to say was I was really happy to hear that you are dealing with children who are like 10 and up because those 
are, that is an area that we are desperate for help for. Yes. There are so many of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, are you seeing these kids alone or with their parents? Both. It just depends on the situation. I have some kids that are involved with victim witness, and I tend to like to see them by themselves so they can play out. And we do a lot of art therapy to um, work out their feelings and their stress. But a lot of them have some problems like ADHD or disruptive behavior problems, and I need the parents involved with that. So I, I'll, a lot of times I'll switch or uh, divide the session into seeing the child and then working with the parents or having working with the child and then the next week working with the parents. So if you, you ask the child, is it okay if your parents are involved in this? Yes, I'm very strict about confidentiality and I explain up front that I will not be discussing what I talk to your child about and do not ask your child about what we talk about. Um, I've set all that out in informed consent. Well, thank you very, very much for what you do because that population is so, so critically in need of help, especially now. Thank it you, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Any other questions by Ms. Friedman? No, I, I, I have no more, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Diana Herwick, do you have questions? Dr. Herwick, do you have questions? Dr. Herwick had to uh, slip out um, for a while, so she will be excused from the discussion. Okay. Christopher Jones. Do you have questions? Uh, no, no, no questions. Just uh, thank you for being here, uh, Ms. Crowley. It sounds like you've had quite the, uh, quite the journey. Thank you. Kelly Rana Singh, do you have questions? Hello, I have no questions, Ms. Crowley. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you very much. No questions. Okay. And Wendy Strack, do you have questions? Um, no, I don't. Uh, thank you, Ms. Crowley, for being here and, and for your testimony. Um, I think your honesty and forthrightness are, are really valuable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Steinheimer, do you have any follow-up questions? I don't. Thank you, Your Honor. Do any of the other board members have any questions? If so, please speak up. Okay. Hearing none, um, Ms. Crawley, this is um, a time for you to give uh, any final remarks or statement that you wish to give to elaborate on what you had said before. Is there anything else you would like to say um, in addition? Um, I think I've said everything. I just want to reiterate that I really would like more time available to continue with my practice and be more available to my clients. Um, I, yeah, um, we're just in a time of need of having to work with a lot of clients right now under different situations and we're still doing, dealing with the campfire here. So I'm trying to work with victim witness and um, free up more time for that and that has a big reason to do with why I'm trying to get off of early um, or early termination of probation. And I just thank everybody for what they've said. It's very um, nice to hear that about my growth and um, I appreciate everybody. So thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Steinheimer, do you wish to give any closing remarks? No, no, you are right, we submit. Okay, then um, the, the matter is submitted um, and the record is closed.
I will prepare a written decision and submit it um, to the board for their approval and I will notify you in due course. And so the record is closed and we are off the record in this matter. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And before we adjourn the board meeting, um, uh, can the court reporter please tell me the number of pages? I have 34 pages. Thank you very much. Back to you, um, back to the chair, chair. Mr. Despotsky. Yes. yes. Thank you, Your Honor. So usually our practice is that um, this is the time where we take our lunch time and then go in closed session since we are um, we have seen heard all the petitioners. So to my border fellow members, I I just maybe I can try to look at your faces. I mean we have done everything at this point, thirty minutes, an hour. So I'm trying to get a feeling. Of how long would you like to go for this break? Um, is forty five minutes okay for all of you? I see some nodding. If you have any issue with that, please let me know. Otherwise, we go for 45 minutes. And that means we will resume the meeting at 12.50. It's 12.05 at this moment. Am I counting right? Yes. <laughs> so at 12.50, we can resume for our closed session of the meeting. And for our public uh, viewers, uh, we are uh, meeting you tomorrow uh, for our uh, public board meeting at 8.30 a.m. on the same channel with the same link. Um, so thank you everyone and I'll see you all and your honor as well at uh, in 45 minutes. Chair Disposti, sure. this yes. is the moderator just to confirm tomorrow's meeting is through a separate link than today's meeting. Thank you. I knew I was going to say something that wasn't really right, but uh, I wasn't sure. <laughs> thank you, moderator. I appreciate your, okay. your correction. Thank you. So we will readjourn uh, in 45 minutes. Thank you, everybody.